so I was at the Desertscape International Film Festival uh, last week, and they premiered your film there, uh, Cryo, and uh, I really enjoyed it. It was it was really fun to watch. It Thank was a you. great watch, and I was like. I gotta like talk to this guy who made this film and and ask him how he did it and and I was just you know excited about it. Now, I consider this, or at least my understanding is, this is kind of your first feature as a director. Would you say that's true? I know you've done yeah, other directing, other little things, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 right. So I've I've done several short films. Um, it, I would say this is kind of my first feature, or it it sort right. of became this. I actually I actually shot. We did principal photography. We wrote it. And did all our pickups and whatnot. So, so most of this was was done while I was 24, still a, a student in film school, um, right. third year film film school student. We did it over the summer, so it was actually never supposed to kind of go as far as it did. Okay. Um, so that's why I have some trepidation calling it my first feature, and that it's like it. We we kind of did this without a budget, doing something experimental, making it for fun, and then it 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 sort of became something bigger than. Um, than we intended. And so um, I'm very proud of the piece, great learning experience, but definitely, definitely like my student feature is what I would call it. Cause I, yeah. I had done a, a bunch of short films um, leading up to it. And then um, the, the process of it took longer than I expected too, simply because of COVID and um, sure. doing this on the obscenely low budget that we did. Um, this really is kind of a, a hybrid of a passion project and what became a, 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 feature with the distribution deal <laughs> so it's yeah. something in that world yeah hey listen if you go to film school and while you're at film school you shoot a feature and you get saban to distribute it i i'd say that's a huge success story right there in and of itself because most you. people most people leave film school with one film that they spend a lot of money on and it's a short film it's their showpiece and uh and it and it certainly doesn't make them any money back so you know yeah. so that's that that in itself is very commendable uh, what you did. Um, Thanks, so, man. so, t so tell me this, when you were a kid many years ago, now that you're in your twenties, um, like what were the films that you loved to watch? What were the things that you got excited about? Well, as a little kid, I grew up on, on the classics on star Wars, on Batman, I loved cartoons. I loved, um, uh, Lord of the Rings as I got older. Sure. Um, as I became a teenager, I, I definitely got way into the Christopher Nolan hype, which you can probably see in my film Cryo. Um, he probably had the greatest impact on me in terms of um, taste, stylistic, you know, um, uh, education, implementing those things. But um, <clears throat> but I really like um, I really, you know, as I got older, developed a, a love for thrillers and psychological films and kind of yeah. mind bending stuff. And and That's that. Cool that um enjoyment has continued to this day that's probably you know one of my favorite genres is just um anything that's kind of in the in the field of noir or um thriller or mystery i love murder mysteries like yeah. agatha christie stuff I, I i could watch hercule poirot episodes all day and so um so yeah it kind of grew from kind of the the the, the mainstream action adventure type stuff indiana jones i loved Sure. to getting more into Hitchcock, Vertigo, Nolan, um, Fincher, that kind of tone. Yeah, yeah. And you could definitely see, you know, those the, all those kind of elements kind of, uh, you know, in your film, but not necessarily like saying, oh, I took this from this film and this from this film, but just, just, the, just the idea of the vibe of it, the feel of it. If you like these kind of films, you'll, yeah. you'll like cryo, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. So, um, hope. yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, obviously I can see where, you know, you get excited about making a film, you know, sci-fi or whatever you mentioned kind of murder mysteries and stuff. And I really, I don't think this wrecks anything for the film, but what I really enjoyed was you even have this nice moment when they're playing clue uh in mm -hmm. the movie and so good and i was just like oh that's Thank awesome you. it's kind of like a sci-fi whodunit and here they are taking yeah. one moment to kind of before things get really bad to play clue and it's a foreshadowing to kind of how what's about to happen so that was really clever i really i really thought that was great thank you Ma mason and i my co-writer mason yeah. d davis, mason and he, davis. Was, uh, he was one of the executive producers he was an actor in the film played the soldier did a brilliant job love working with him yeah um he and I purposefully, we had him play Clue, but we also, we kind of, that was actually more of an afterthought because we were putting 
little references to Clue throughout the film. So there's actually like a lead pipe is used, a rope is used, yeah, it's great. all of these different things to kind of, you know, pay homage to that that who done it feeling. It's if you don't if you've never played Clue as a board game, then there's something wrong with you because it's a it's a classic <laughs> game, right? You know, and they've even right. made they've even yep. made a movie oh, about it, of course, right? So, um, talking yeah. about working with Mason and the writing process, um, is this? It, did you reverse engineer this movie, saying, "Hey, we only have this much money and this much time, so what can we do with it?" Did you already have a location, or did you start with the idea first and then say, "Could we? Can we pull this off?" Like, what was the genesis there? How did you yeah. do that? That's a great question, Ryan. It was it was kind of a blend of the two, so how this all started is, is I wanted to make a, a feature film that year. And, um, I, I, I posted about it on Facebook kind of as my new year's resolution. And, um, cause you know, that was a big endeavor and I thought, okay, if I set a goal, maybe it'll happen. I don't know. And, um, uh, Mason reached out to me because we'd worked together and we had a great experience and I love working with him. He has a lot of belief in, in me and, and, um, we just collaborate well. And so he said, Hey, I have this idea for a script. It was a completely different script. Um, it was a Western kind of a, kind of a Neo Western required a large, large budget. And we raised almost like a little over half the funding that we would have needed. We got committed to it, but as we got closer and closer to the summer, it became evident that there was no way to really pull this off correctly without the proper budget. So we yeah. pulled the plug on it. We said, ah, let's scrap it. We'll do this another time. We don't want to paint ourselves in a corner here, but you know, this was like, getting into maybe late spring, early summer. And Mason and I were like, well, shoot, we still want to make something. Like we have the summer, we had set aside time. We wanted to make a feature. And so Mason and I and our, our producer, Matt Seamers, all sat around and were like, well, does anyone have any ideas for something really shootable? We don't have any budget committed. Like what could we make? Right. And I had this little concept that I had toyed with a few years earlier with one of my friends, very simple kind of whodunit setup, which you've probably seen like uh, from, from my understanding uh, um, and I, I, I saw these films later than cryo. So I didn't see these movies and rip off of them, but I know this is a very archetypal kind of setup, which is people wake up from cryo chambers and they can't remember who, who they are, you know, and evidently that's kind of in Pandora, a little bit in cube, you know, mm -hmm. like what are we doing here? And so that's been done before. And I knew that. Um, but I liked that scenario of like, you know, what happens when you've got these, these kind of primal archetypal characters who can't remember anything, they're suspicious of each other, and we don't know who woke them up. Uh, they find what seems like evidence of a murder, and they, they determine either somebody's down there with them or one of them is not telling the truth. We knew we needed it isolated. And so I, I pitched that to Mason and Matt, and they really liked it. And... Um, and then that's when we dove in and got a little bit into some of more of the complicated, uh, you know, multi-layered complexity of this twist, which I won't share. Um, but I wanted it to stand out of like, okay, yeah. what, 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 what could we do more with this yeah. while still kind of following that whodunit format? And so from there, Mace and I, we originally, we actually sat it in a cabin in the woods, like some facility, some building. And we've scouted a bunch of places. And then we looked at each other one day in the writing process. And we're like, why are we putting this in a cabin? Like after 500 years or something, if they were asleep, this cabin would be gone. We need to put it underground. And so that's when we found that amazing location, which had all of the spaces all connected. And mm -hmm. so we wrote to those constraints. But we already got had it. kind of that idea of, one location, multiple rooms. We just got lucky finding that place. Mm -hmm. And so like our idea informed looking for simple creative constraints. And then yeah. those creative constraints turned around and informed some of the script. So yeah. um, it was kind of kind of both of those things. Yeah. And so were you and Mason, were you tag teaming like, hey, you take these scenes, I'll take these ones. Here's the outline. Or were you like every scene you wrote together? Yes, we we that's ex the first one is exactly what we did. We did an outline and then we would we would split scenes or if I'm remembering correctly, we may have even done like chunks or acts and then we'd swap and rewrite each other's stuff and, and yeah. figure it out. It went through several iterations and um, something that we're we're proud of, but we don't think is some like a like a badge of honor that any filmmaker should aspire to. It's just how short it took to write this. Mm -hmm. Both Mason and I wish we had had more time. 
sure. but we were coming up on the summer and uh and we both had semesters we had to start again in the fall and so we had to hurry and make sure the script pretty much worked um and that's why we had to do some pickups later is there were some things that weren't were a little underbaked um yeah. but for what it was i i feel extremely proud that like less than eight weeks later from starting it we were shooting um, and so we just worked on this thing every single day and we'd meet all the time and really make sure we did a table read with some talented filmmakers. They gave us great feedback and, and more or less, we knew where it was always going. And mm -hmm. so the trick was like, how do we make sure it gets there in a, yeah. in a really effective way, if that makes sense. So, so you, you get the script done, you're moving, you've got a deadline, you got school coming up. You want to get this shot. You've, you found a yeah. cool location. How do you, uh, how do you approach casting on this film? Do you just call some friends that you know you've worked with before? Do you do a bunch of casting sessions? Like, what did you do? No, kind of. We just called, called friends who we knew were really, really good. We did do some casting sessions actually. Um, and, um, the casting sessions did make a difference in some of the final decisions we made. But every single cast member uh, who's part of Cryo, we have a personal connection to. So like, for example, I had worked with Morgan before on my short film, The Next Door. He's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, he is good. He's very uh, good. But he's super good. Um, but Morgan Gunter also was in Mason's acting workshop that he was holding, right? Mm. Um, so was Jillian. Petrie, and that's how I met Jillian was through Mason, and they were holding their acting workshop in comedy sports, which Kirk Dowsett owns, and uh, Mason had a connection to Kirk. Um, yeah. Emily Marie Palmer, who's who's a phenomenal actress, she's been in Cobra Kai, uh, the 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 recent Western The Last Sun. Um, I know her personally because we're both from Tennessee, and I grew up with her cousin and was really good friends with her cousin, so I already had a connection. Yeah. And so all of the actors who were in the film, I think besides Kirk, who we just cast. Um, uh, all of the actors in the film, we did audition along with others, but, but between their, their excellence and then also the rapport and the personal connection, we ended up just bringing them together. We kind of found the best who we could find and thought, well, they will just, they will just work off of each other's energy and talent. And that's exactly what they did. I think with a film like this, you know, you, you, every decision has to be the right decision. And I think by casting people that you have relationships with, you, Mason specifically had worked with some of them before you had worked with Gunther, I love Gunther, Gunther's great. Um, you kind of knew what you were getting into. You knew these guys were team players. You knew, you knew what you could yeah. get out of them. You knew they were directable, you know, all these things. And as nice as it is to use some fresh actors and bring some people in that you're excited about, you never know what they're going to be like on set. So if you do a film like this where you have to have a very specific tight schedule and you bring in somebody who becomes difficult, it can really shut everything down. You could get less coverage. You don't make your days, you know, all these things. So I, I think, I think what's great about what you've done here is you've, you've, you've designed a movie and then put people in it that you've worked with that has really allowed you to have that, the collaboration and also just to be able to move quickly because you know how these people are going to work with you, you know? So I think that's pretty yeah, cool how thanks. you did that. So Yeah, and they um, were great. They were super, super team players, all of them. Fantastic. Now, you, you, you mentioned, obviously, you probably did table reads together with the actors. Did you ever get a chance to go walk the space and rehearse it before you shot, or did you just go for it? You know, that's actually a great question. I'm trying to remember. Yes, we did. We did rehearse in that space a little bit, especially because of how how available that space was. I mean, we, we shot the whole film two blocks from where I was living at the time. It's in the Provo underground. It's just all, besides yeah. just a couple of pickups, it's all just under Provo. And the manager was so cool in that he, he manages all that space down there. And he gave us kind of free access to all of the rooms, just as long as we booked out the Airbnb that he, that he has down there. There's a cool, really sweetly designed Airbnb and and so we booked that for two weeks. So yeah. that whole location probably cost us something like fifteen hundred dollars because that was just the cost of That's two great. weeks of this Airbnb. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so yes, I believe we did rehearse. Um, I I don't know if we did a table read. Frankly, the actors were kind of confused the whole time because it's a confusing movie. And on top of that, we're shooting it out of order. And on top oh, of that, true. Mason and I redacted the last like 10 pages of the script because we didn't want them to know what the ending was, oh, I um, see. which was 
a little bit frustrating to the actors at times, but I think it actually helped because it's, it, it really is one of these, like, I woke up from a cryo chamber. I can't remember anything. Did I do it? Did I do something? I, yeah. I'm just really not sure. And so, That's great. um, yeah, they had to depend a lot on like, just trust me, it's going to read this way, even yeah. if the motivations yeah. are all over the place. That's great. That's great. So you go into production. It's, it's, yes. It's not a 90 minute movie. It's an hour and 50 some odd minutes. It's a, it's a pretty hefty page count. So yeah. did you guys go, okay, we're going to do 15 pages a day. I mean, like, how did you decide how much you were going to do in a day? For the most part, it actually was tied more to location than page count. Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, because so much of the movie happens in just the different rooms all across that facility. And so what we would do is that first scene where they all meet each other, we just shot everything in that room for two days, I think. And then uh, <clears throat> then we would go to like the lab or we would go to the kitchen or the doctor's office or whatever and yeah. just shoot everything we could. And so we, we based kind of our page rate or count around what, what can we get done in this location. And what we would do with art <clears throat> is art would just be setting up the next room while we're finishing in a certain room so that sometimes we would break and go to the next space right yeah um yeah and and because because a lot of the film is a lot of dialogue between characters um what i tried to do in my shot list is is we we didn't shoot a ton of coverage i tried to get really purposeful and specific in the shots and yeah. so um between blocking between rather than just put everything on a wide, like if, if I did need to get a lot of stuff happening in the wide, I would try to make sure if I had one or two reverses that they were really, really meaningful, intentional, we were kind of trying to shoot for the edit. That sometimes worked, that sometimes didn't work. And a lot of, you know, like I said, we went back and got pickups, probably like five days worth of pickups. Um, but but we, we, we were moving at a pretty extraordinary pace. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, I'm trying to remember how many pages we got done per day, but, but sometimes. <laughs> well, how many, so, so, so yeah. how, how many, how many days did you say you took to shoot the film? Uh, it was about 12 or 13 days on principle and, and then, then five the days or so on pickups. Though those weren't straight five sure. days. It was like a half a day here, a full day there kind yeah. of moving around. Well, I spaces. think, I do think that like it's, it, it's cool as it is to say you shot a movie in 12 days and you got the whole thing. I, for me, you know, as I go in and I do my rough edits of a film or whatever, I always find things that I need to put band-aids on and fix and hide. So I always yeah. end up yep. second unit and second unit for me sometimes is like no sound hand doubles, just, just little things yeah. you go get with you and like two other people and, Nobody ever knows, you know, that you did it. It looks totally like it matches, and but it makes the film so much better. It elevates the film, and so it's it's always good to see that uh, when people take the care to do their edit and go, you know what? If we did a close up right here of this hand or whatever, it's really going to make it better. And to go back and do that, so it's cool that you, I, you did that. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, we we to your point, a lot of the inserts, for example, sometimes we need an insert to make something clearer. That's often my hand or I'm wearing the cryo sure. suit or whatever. Um, we actually went back and wrote additional scenes for, for more hefty pickups. Like there, there are a couple scenes that, in my opinion, are some of the best scenes in the film. And those were pickup scenes that we were like, this, this character's arc is, is not working. And we really need this to complete the character. And it, it transformed the movie just yeah. to get a few of those and come back with some of the actors. But I mean, again, that location was so cool. I almost felt like I own the place. I mean, for a year afterward, we would just go in and bring, you know, one Quasar or something and shoot a little insert of a, of a microphone or, yeah. um, you know, of a hand zipping something up or whatever. And, and they were just super chill about it. So, That's cool. Well, let me ask you some technical yeah. questions just, just so I know this. So okay. what, what, what did you, uh, what was the format you shot it on? I'm assuming it's a single camera shoot, right? Yeah. Single camera shoot. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, for the for the most part, it was a it was an Alexa. Um, okay, so like an Alexa Mira or, or... Too. 
was an Alexa Mira or like a Mini or an LF or? Um, I think it was the classic Airy Alexa. It wasn't a Mini. Mm -hmm. It was Roman owns it. Roman Alevi, our, our DP. So that, that was another oh, thing that saved us gotcha. tons and tons of um, budget was that Roman like came with the camera package and the lights and whatnot. I mean, he, he, he owns a lot of his own equipment. That's so great. he just shot on his own cameras. Um, we did some stuff on uh, a red, some pickups. Um, I think it was, a, I cannot remember what model it was of the red. Um, we did some pickups on a black magic pocket. Again, some of those quick inserts camera. or just, so yeah. So, I mean, we had, yeah. a, we had a variety, but most of it was on the Aerie Alexa. And, yeah. um, and it was all just one camera at, at, at any given time. And handheld, I'm assuming, right? Is that a lot for of the most part? Help. Yep. We yeah. put we put some stuff on sticks and then we also had some dolly shots, but oh, um, okay. but a lot a lot of those scenes where they're all just talking, we would just cover handheld and and some of that even I would to save time, we would just we would just rehearse the crap out of that scene 10 minutes before, just have them go over and over and over their lines. And then I would just tell Roman, just shoot it. Just look, look at different characters and we're gonna run this scene like like seven times. And sure. so we would just get lots and lots of kind of that really kind of run and gun handheld um, cinema verte style um, in the scene. Well, I think also too, with something where you're trying to move really quickly, handheld can really help just facilitate speed, you know? Um, so yeah, that was right. pretty cool. And you mentioned, you know, using quasars and things like that. And I noticed, and it, it was nice because it was a sci-fi film. You did a lot of cool colors with reds and blues and the tubes are very quick. You can stick them up. You can have battery powered yep. ones and you can really move quickly. And, um, it's nice to see, you know, or where we are from a technical standpoint of specific, specifically for independent films where you can get LED lights that have a lot of output, battery powered, easy to set up, move them around quickly, can control them with apps and, you know, DMX and different things like this, and really can speed up the process. And so I assume that you guys, um, you played, you played into that, you use that technology, that LED technology to be a character in the movie, but also just allow you to move quickly, I think. At least that's what it yes, seemed to me. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Ex yeah. To your point, it saved us a ton of time to just those magnetic or, you know, those tubes, we just slap them up on something. Um, and it, we don't even try to hide them. I mean, they're they're right there in the movie. But yeah, they're a character just like in the you movie. said, because it's a sci-fi, you can kind of get away with it, you know? Yeah. So now that we've kind of talked about the production aspect of, of your show, Cryo, um, I have to ask, you know, when you're filming in one location without windows <laughs> and you're in the basement of some place and you're shooting for a lot of days, I mean, do you get a sense of cabin fever where you kind of like, I'm going to go nuts if we film in here anymore? Or were you quite happy to be in your little cave? Yes, that, that's an excellent question. I loved it because it put me in the, in the zone, you know? Um, and, and that place is full of weird smells and, um, that we would, you know, we thought sound was going to be a problem in the film because we could always hear like pipes and fluid and people walking around. Um, we actually had one of our, our actors, Emily Marie Palmer, she was in from Atlanta and we flew her out there and we, we had to put her up somewhere. And even though she has family, we thought it would be, um, more, just effective and practical if she stayed in the Airbnb that we were renting. We had three rooms in there and she hated it. I mean, she was scared out of her mind staying there because between the film being kind of creepy and then you, you like it's under a mall. So you can hear people walking around um, or just like any kind of creak or movement. And, and see, when we were done, we'd, we'd finish a, you know, a 12 hour day and, and um, I go up and outside and it's nighttime and it's a nice warm night in Provo and I might go get some food and get ready for the next day. She just had nowhere to go. So she just stayed down there, which was great for her character, um, yeah. you know, just being stuck down there. But yeah. um, yes, it, it, there definitely was cabin fever. And right. I was I was definitely appreciative of it because I think it added to the the atmosphere and the feel of that movie. Well, that's very cool. I, you know, she might have thought, not thought it was cool, but I'm sure it helped her character. I'm sure it did. So <laughs> she, in retrospect, said she thought it was fun that we had her stay there. Mason stayed the night just for one night to, to be like, oh, give me a break. It's not that scary. And, and, and he left 
he he after that night he was like dude i'm never staying down there again this place is weird and it's just a weird place i mean yeah. you should go check it out it's it's strange um so working with the actors you know you had your script were you guys pretty true to uh the dialogue or was there a little improvisation allowed with the actors i mean what works for your film with that whenever we were shooting we were more or less true to the to the script but yeah we kept changing our minds and going back and fiddling with it until it was right and there's nothing wrong with fiddling with your movie especially if you can you know edit it test it show it to some people walk away from it and come back to it with fresh eyes you know that's always yeah. helpful because then you go oh my gosh what was i thinking two weeks ago you know so exactly. to have that luxury is is only helps to make the movie better i i think so that's it's nice that you you had that time on on your side to be mm -hmm. able to go back in and and get those band-aid shots or second unit shots or whatever you want to refer to them as but whatever those shots were to help make it a better production it's nice it's nice when you have that time to, to do that yeah well that, that that was honestly ryan even though there were disadvantages and how limited we were that was one of the advantages to being so ungodly low budget just an obscenely low amount of money is we didn't have to answer to anyone you know like yeah. there was no investor kind of breathing down our neck and so we took our time to make sure like hey we have kind of one shot at this let's make sure we get it as good as we think we can make it and then yeah. put it out there so you move into post-production you're editing the film are you editing the film yourself did you have an editor how did you attack that part of it we went through a few different editors for different reasons um that's part of what what took so long is just there were again doing it on really no budget you you, you can you can you can plan and you can shoot a film for a crazy low budget, but to to execute post production effectively, something I learned is you have to have money there. And so we went out and raised more money eventually just to finish the thing. Um, but yeah, we went we went through a couple of different editors, and be, due to complications and kind of extenuating circumstances with not not having money and them having jobs and me having a job and some some lack of communication and whatnot um i ended up doing a cut myself so we had we had two great you know cuts that really moved us along i did a pass and then finally aaron hinton who was our final editor who was also an ac on the film he said he's a great editor he said hey let me let me take a pass at this i think i think you're almost there there's just some things I'm noticing that I would love to implement. We said, sure, we, we, we love your editing. We love your work. Go ahead. And, um, and then he took us to that final locked cut that was just like, there we go. That's, that, that made it clear. That took a long time, though. Um, between his job, between some of the structural things of this changing hand so many times, he kind of had to, in some, to some capacity, start over. Um, and it, it took a, a long amount of time and then COVID too, just slowed yeah. everything down and slowed right. the ability to meet in person. And cause I love to sit down with my editor and, and edit together, you know, as much as possible. And that just wasn't, that just wasn't possible because of COVID. Um, finally at the end of, of, at the beginning of 2021, um, kind of right around January, we locked the cut and then we spent all of 2021, like, like plowing through the rest of post-production because we could not take another year on this thing i mean it had already been several years and and so we did color sound music and vfx all at the same time when some of those things should probably be one after the other we just had them working simultaneously we formed a discord we got really really um uh good at communication and and following up and and really proactive with just hard deadlines and pushing through we found that initial investment which we used to our full capacity and um and we we rushed through that last year of post in a way that i thought was just fantastic and and detailed and good and we got great work and that was probably one of my favorite parts of making the film is just creating the sound design with my sound designer eric now and I, I every day i would end work and my wife and i at the time were just sharing our one car i mean like i said i'm just out of school and uh and so she had the car and so i i bought a little electric scooter and would scooter you know um ten, you know 
10 miles over to, to, to Orem and sit down with my sound editor. And we do it for four day or four hours for two or three days a week, you know, every day, it's just, I'm going to go work on sound and we sit down and do it together or getting passes from our composer who lives in London. He's a friend of mine that I've never met in person, but yeah. I loved his music. When I was a teenager, I found him. He scored a couple of short films of mine and this, this was our first feature working together and he'd send me cues and we'd drop them in. I mean, it was, it was exciting, but it was rough. It was yeah. really intense, just dropping everything in all at once and hoping it would work. When in respect to the the music of the film, which is great, it's it's it it really supports the genre of the film. Um, I think he did a great job with that. Um, did you you know did you do kind of a temp score beforehand to kind of get the vibe of what you're yes. looking for, or did you just let them be creative? Like, how did you approach that? Yes, that's a great question. I love temp scores um, because they help me feel the. Uh, uh, and and uh, they, they kind of create a tone and I will pull from movies that are similar that I looked to for inspiration. Like a good example was um, Annihilation, the Alex Garland film. I really liked that movie. I used a lot of that score in the temp. However, I know there's a danger to temp scores. Yeah, you fall in because, love with it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I tried the whole time to be very, very open to like, this is not permanent. This is just to convey a, uh, a tone. And for that reason, I did not try to like really truly score the movie with the temp score. We use stuff from all over. Like we use stuff from freaking Spider-Man two because it like fit the tone and, and, and it, it did not fit with the other parts of the temp. Sure. And so it was all just right. meant to kind of give an idea. And I told yeah. our composer, Sam, I said, Hey, listen, I'm not married to this. These are just to give you flavors and ideas of kind of what the feel is I'm looking for. Do your own thing. And surprisingly, Sam actually told me, he was like, I actually really like temp scores. They give me a lot to go off of. And it helped guide him and just kind of give him a springboard the entire time. So the score ended up being more or less what I had hoped it would be exactly. Um, oh, that's great. The only surprises, the only surprises were really innovative, interesting things that Sam brought to the table that I was like, oh, I've never even considered playing with kind of whispers and stuff in 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 cool ways. And so he's he's just such a such a professional. It's really great when you can work with people who can elevate what you bring to the table. You have an idea, you've thought through it, you've planned it out, and you you share your ideas, and then somebody takes that and goes, you know what? That's great. And what if we just tweak this a little bit? And you're like, oh my gosh, you just took it up another level. So it's always great when you can find people like that that can elevate your efforts, you know, and your ideas. Well, to your point, I mean, so I forgot about this, but but it was so impressive and encouraging to me that Sam understood the film and the twist on an intuitive level. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is there were scenes where I had not given him instruction to elude musically to what's really going on there's a particular scene in general where we're cutting we're kind of jump cutting or what we think is jump cutting in in a scene it's, it's right toward the end and he sam does these things with with music and time where he's like yep, 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 and it kind of is implying sort of the the jump cutting is doing something else i did not instruct him to do that it was it was an intuitive thing he picked up from the edit that he understood the movie. And that made me feel really good. That made me feel really proud of Aaron Hinton for like, for adding that piece that is serving the twist. And then for Sam to understand it and bring his own magic to it. It was like, oh, that's so good. He gets it. He gets what we're going for. Not everyone will, but he likes and understands what we're trying to say here and do here on a, on a, like through the medium. And um, so impressive when you get an expert who just is on that same wavelength, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I I totally make sense with what you're saying. And it's cool that it worked out that way for you guys on this film. Now, I have to assume that because of what you're saying about the time it took to do the movie, which which in a lot of ways is a luxury, which is great to have the time to really go through it methodically and, 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 and shape it and show it to people and get feedback and all this stuff. I have to assume that distribution was not in place before you started because no distributor no. would sit around that long and be like, yeah, don't take all the time you want. We're here, you know? So how does, how does distribution come into play? Do you do film festivals and get distribution? Do you have someone who connects you and you show it to them? Like kind of just tell me how that worked. That's a great question. And, and Mason and I particularly learned along the way that we kind of did it in the wrong order. And so we got, we got very lucky 
And and I think part of that is we're proud of the film we made. I think it I think it works well enough at least to land distribution. Part of it were just some some fortuitous circumstances that we stumbled into. But this is something I I I I learned, and I'm fine. A lot of filmmakers don't really know the business side of of movie making. Um, they think that. Uh, a movie starts with an idea and you go out and you write a script and you shoot and 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 they're doing all of this without the distribution side of it in mind. Now, like I mentioned before, we were so low stakes, we were kind of doing it for fun, but hoping we would sell the movie and whatnot. But I, I just didn't know enough about selling a movie. And now looking back, it's like, wow, we kind of did this in the wrong order. You need to find distribution first. That's where you start. And then you make your film and it's through that that you raise the 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 funds and whatnot. Anyway. We finished this movie and Mason Mason did a deep dive on film distribution, learned a ton of stuff, went to, well, it was digital, but, but, but attended the American film market, watched all the seminars, learned everything he could. We applied it to our film. We went and found a great sales agent, Phil Gorn, who, who Mason had read about. Um, and had read in several of these books glowing things about him that he's very honest, that he's very filmmaker friendly, that you can get screwed in a lot of these areas. And sure that uh, Phil has just been a wonder. And if it was through that that reference, you know, that that learning about him and, and reading about him, I don't know exactly what the book was, but but Mason reached out to him and said, hey, would you, we've read about you, we like you, would you like to be our agent for this film? He watched the film, he said, wow, I'm really impressed by this. And the fact that you reached out to me and know who I am, I'd love to take this on. And Phil shopped it around, found us some great deals in other territories. And, and then finally for the US Canada deal, he, he had a contact at Saban and, um, and we were able to form a, a, a deal that we both really liked. I mean, especially for the, the size of the movie and for no star power, we, we got, it, it was a little bit of a Cinderella story for us. And so um, my big takeaway though, and Mason's is we try to share with as many independent filmmakers, recent graduate filmmakers, student filmmakers who may not understand that process as much as we can, because as, as fun it is, as it is to make a movie, there's that whole other side to it that I just find that a lot of people don't, don't know, or if they do know, they kind of guard, you know, they kind of, they kind of, um, don't share. I'm still learning about that. I mean, to, that's why I'm seeking more mentors to really, hopefully I've, I've kind of demonstrated, okay, I can make something, but I really want to understand the best way to go about this, to make money back, to, to get a film out there. But ours, our distribution was as much as an educational process as it was a, a for, fortuitous process for us. So yeah. um, it's thanks to a good agent. It's thanks to a good cut. It's thanks to good actors and just kind of getting it in front of the right people at the right time that we were able to land this deal. Well, and to you, a fresh idea, a concept that was engaging enough for people to watch for two hours and want to to, to take this ride with you and see it to the to the end. So that's obviously a part Thank of you. it as well. I think though, what's interesting is, you know, specifically with a company like Saban, Saban's distribution plan a lot of times requires a million dollar name attached to the film and requires a certain percentage of action or whatever it is, you know, for their distribution deals. Yeah, a lot of times people will do these these uh, pre-sale deals with companies like Saban, but they'll have to have a letter of intent and a, a pay or play deal with a with a with a recognizable household name, you know, attached and and they will guarantee a certain amount of money against a bank loan or however you want to finance it and things like that. And so it's cool that, you know, you got in with a company like Savon and did it a different way uh, and, and have that relationship. So being with Savon for domestic and then having foreign sales for foreign, it's just it's just awesome that it worked out that way for you guys. That's really great because it doesn't work that way for everybody. And a lot of times people finish their film and this is kind of what I think you're alluding to is, you know, you make a movie and you go, great, now someone needs to buy it. And then you have to go out with hat in hand and say, I have this movie. And then people, as you say, and, and I agree with you, people take advantage of you and they're like, Hey, these yeah. guys have no distribution plan. Let's screw them over and offer them nothing. They don't know any better. They'll probably take our crappy deal. And they don't care if they build a relationship with you because there's a thousand more filmmakers 
that are doing the same thing and they'll just keep burning bridges because they don't care. There's an endless supply of people that they can screw over and get movies for cheap from. So it's glad yeah. to see that this is not what happened to you guys and and that your true success story. Now, let me ask you this question. In retrospect, though, do you think you would do it differently in respect to distribution? Because if you went out and said, I'm going to make this movie in a basement, this is the story, this is my cast, do you feel like you could have got someone like a Saban or whatever to agree to it before making it? Or do you feel like they had to see it to get excited about it? That's a good question, Ryan. I, I've never even really considered it. When I think of things I would do differently, they all have to do with like story or length or, or tension or structure or book character motivations. I've never even considered whether I would do, whether we would do distribution differently. I'd say no, because to your point, I think they needed to kind of see it. It was, it was already hard enough to sell my cast and crew on like this multi-layered thing I was trying to do, right? Um, that was already like uh, tricky enough for me. I think to try to like sell it and be like, no, 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 like I promise it, it'll work because there's these, there are these layers and things would have been even harder. And so, and, and we wouldn't have learned everything we did. I, I wouldn't have known what to do. And so I'm glad it worked out the way it did. Yeah. Um, I just want to improve my craft as a filmmaker, as a storyteller. And now that I know how to do it, it will be much more effective to, to do my next features kind of in the, yeah. in the proper order. I just, I say it because like, it's like, I wouldn't change what we did, but I don't recommend anyone to do it because it's so risky. I mean, risky, there was yes. so low stakes. Yes. There was so low stakes that it like, it wasn't, it wouldn't have been the end of the world, but, um, but if let's say like what I had done instead is instead of shooting for this obscenely low amount of money that most of us personally just kind of put in and pooled and that most of our investors didn't think they would ever see again. Um, Angel investors, we right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Investors. Angel investors yeah, like, right. okay, here's exactly. some, here's some money. Good luck. And then they go, Oh, you made money. Yeah. Oh, I didn't expect that. You know, that's very much what a lot of it was. Our post, our, Post-production investor um, was a little more serious, but it's once he saw what we were really doing. Up until like shooting it, it was just kind of a summer. I mean, it was the same budget, Ryan, as like my other short films. That's what we did it for. And everybody was on a deferred pay model, which I know people say never do that. And that's not the way, but we, they were all students. They were going to work on it anyway. In fact, right. for the most part, we wanted to just honor them by saying, hey, if we ever make money, we're going to pay you first, you know, like, yeah. and that's what we plan to do. Um, that's but, great. Uh, if we had gone out and raised a million bucks and then we we're trying to shop our film around and it turns out no one wanted to buy us, buy yeah. it, that would be so much worse than doing it and then kind of getting lucky and, and selling the movie and g getting back what we put in, yeah. which was, was not very much at all. Yeah. So, um, so I don't, I don't recommend that. I think it's smarter for filmmakers to really learn the business, but if you don't really have anyone to teach you that, or if you don't learn that in film school, or if if you just need to just get your feet wet, I say go out and shoot something. Just don't pour a ton into it. Just like just like yeah. hone craft and do it, and then it might turn into something cool yeah. like this. That's a great answer because you know I think we, as you were saying, you know you were like ah oh, you know I didn't realize that really distribution should be in place beforehand and all that, and that's true. It's, it's really the safer way to do it. But the problem is, is the time it takes to do that. You're like, I could have shot this yeah. movie already. So especially right. if the stakes are low and you can shoot in one location with friends and everybody's a team player and everything, it's almost just for that kind of a level of a movie, it's almost the better way to do it because a movie yeah. gets made where you're like, hey, the right way is to do it this way, get get a pre-sale, get an actor attached, you know, all that. You'd be like, wow, it's been like five years and we haven't made the movie yet, you know? Right. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword, I guess is what I'm I guess is, is what I'm saying. You know. So. You're right. And to your point, if you have a fun team on board who loves doing this just to do it, that's a that's a tricky thing, right? Because there's all these these kinds of, you know filmmakers like amateur filmmakers that go out and pay people in exposure and do it you know really like 
take advantage of people. But if you're just with a fun team who wants to do this as craft, who, who's having fun with this and you can do it for nothing, if you can do it for nothing and you write with those creative constraints in mind, you're not adding explosions and things like you, you wait for that, then, then you've actually generated an asset. You've made something valuable from nothing. And then you're actually in, a, in an advantageous space because it's like, wow, we shot this really weird, cool, experimental, you know, genre piece that uh, now we can go shop around and we're, we're none the worse for it if nobody takes it. So, right. Yeah. yeah. It's, that's the thing about this business is it's so you never know. There's a hundred ways to do things, you know, and, and they all have their, their, their risks and their, their advantages. Absolutely. Yeah. So I love the key. I love the key art. I also love the tagline. Once you once you wake up, the nightmare begins. Very clever. Clever. Uh, the synopsis is very clean, very easy to understand. All of that stuff is really well designed. Did the key art and the tagline is that something that Saban brings to the table? Is that something you guys already had from day one? Like when does that come into play? Because it's really well designed. It's a good key art. Thank you. Um, so so funny enough, um, the the tag the 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 tagline is something. It, it's a variation of something we came up with. I think they reworded it just a little bit, but that idea was ours. Um, the key art of the woman in the ice cube, that was Saban's. And we actually went to Gary Dalton and he was extremely generous with us. Gary Dalton is a poster designer um, who has done tons of work that you you would know. Like he did, he's done all the recent Bond stuff of you know um sky falls specter no time to die uh he did nightmare alley recently he's done stuff for better call saul i mean he's an industry poster designer you know um and we reached out to him and two others uh to design our key art over instagram and just said hey we are a no budget student film um trying to sell our movie we can pay you this much would you would you be willing to help us out we love your work and uh, Gary was ex extremely um, uh, generous and said, yeah, sure, I I'd be happy to. And he actually gave us two posters for the price of one. And so I don't know if you've seen it floating around, but there's our, our posters that we developed were um, like a shattered mirror of all the characters, a green shattered mm. mirror, all their not, a bunch of eyes. I haven't seen that one. And then the other one looked more like a horror poster, um, which was, uh, you know, one of the characters and his fingers trying to open the cryo chamber and it's all black beautiful um logo designed by our our guy who did the the big you know logo in the film ben maxi we loved those posters we went to saban we said hey here's our posters so by gary dalton like these are impressive saban said that's great you can use them for whatever but we're going to develop our own key art and at the time i was a little like whoa why but once i saw the reasoning i thought okay well these guys know what they're talking about they're buying the film so they're selling the film they yeah. said bright sci-fi colors that's what's hot right now that's what's in it catches the eye and i i didn't i didn't hate the 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 thing that they presented it's funny because they went to one of the other two poster designers that we had contacted and then we ended up going with gary um so he ended up making a poster for cryo after all and That's especially cool. on the streaming platforms, it just looks good. It's cool. It's it's true to the concepts of the film. So um, it's very different tonally, um, but it was very interesting to see how that how that process works. I was thinking a lot about the the methodology of the um, you know the story and what are we implying, and they were thinking what sells, what's cool, and what still ties back to the movie in some way. So it's it's cool that we got it. I just, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you look at Gareth Edwards, he does monsters and then he, what does he give him as a second movie? Oh, Godzilla, you know? So, Hey, you know, I'd like right. to see the same thing happen for you where someone's like, you know, cryo, it's really great. And then boom, all of a sudden you're given a huge budget of something that's kind of in that genre. Cause you think about monsters for him. And then you think about Godzilla, you see the connect it's, it's visual effects right. and, and monsters. And so that's how they make the connection yes. there. But uh, I know we've been talking about cryo this whole time. It's been awesome to kind of help uh, have you kind of break it down and, and inspire people that are thinking about doing their first features. People are going, I got to see this thing. So where, where can people see cryo right now? It is available for rent or download all over the place. It's on, 
Prime Video, it's on iTunes, it's on Apple TV, it's on Vudu, it's on Google Play. Um, if you look up Watch Cryo on Google, you're certain to find a platform where you can rent it or buy it. Um, and it will probably be streaming sometime in the future. I know that was Saban's plan is to just float it around. If not, it will live, it will live there forever, um, completely available to, to rent or, or buy. Um, you can't miss it. Uh, Microsoft uh, TV and movies, like there's, there, there are a ton of, direct TV even, it's on direct TV. That's great. So yeah, plenty of platforms to, to find it. Awesome. Well, I think people should definitely check it out if they're into sci-fi psychological thrillers. And I think if you're someone who's thinking about making your first feature and 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 what is a good, I don't want to say prototype, but just a, something that good that would inspire you to kind of give you ideas, definitely watch Cryo because I think Cryo can show you what can be done on limited resources with limited time and, and, and can be a successful uh, story, you know. So definitely check it out. Either way, you should definitely see Cryo. All right, my friend, my last question for you is, where can people find you on social media and see what shenanigans and things you're doing right now? Great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, so I'm on, I'm on Instagram, Facebook. I'm not very active on Twitter, but I'm, I'm on there. Um, I, IMDB, you can look at my stuff, but, but probably the best place would be my website, burgundy.com. That's the name of my brand, my production company. It's behind me. If you there want to it see is. Burgundy. Look at that. Um, look at that. So, so, my last name's Bergen. So Berg, B-U-R-G as in Bergen and Indy as an in indie film. I am nice. so it's spelled that way. Burgundy.com. You can go there. You can see all my short films. You can see the press about cryo. Um, I'm, I'm constantly building that. And then also I, I write about film and, and science and new media and religion. I have a few uh, articles I've, I posted online. So it's, it, it, it's, it's hard not to find me if you look me up. Um, and, uh, but Burgundy is, is the best place to see what's in development and, and what I'll be putting out next. Awesome. Barrett, thank you so much for hanging out with me on the podcast. It's been great to learn about your film. I'm excited to see where you go from here. And, uh, again, just thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate you having me.